paper. So, mm -hmm. um, James, you have a tough task because yours is on machine learning specific prediction of heart failure hospitalization using CMR based phenotype and electronic health information. So that includes a lot of data, not just MR. So curious to, to hear what you say about your fantastic work published in Frontiers uh, in cardiovascular medicine just a few weeks ago. Oh, great. Um, thanks, Matthias. And yeah, it's going to be a bit of a challenge in 10 minutes, but we're going to do our very best. And so thanks for inviting me to, uh, to speak. So I'm uh, representing the uh, Stevenson Cardiac Imaging Center in Calgary. And uh, the work we're presenting here is a paper just published on machine learning patient pre uh, prediction of heart failure hospitalization using combination of cardiac MR and electronic health information. Uh, this work um, was done by obviously a, a, a large team. Unfortunately, the person, Aidan Pornhill, is a master's student that assisted uh, in doing this work, isn't available. Uh, Stephen Dykstra is on the line, uh, so can answer some more technical questions if some people want. He's one of my PhD students. Um, and so let's go through this, um, uh, hopefully efficiently. Uh, so the, the impetus for this was uh, heart failure hospitalization as a clinical outcome is now being recognized as being very important, um, both from this patient perspective for morbidity and mortality, but uh, also for healthcare expenditure with about $15,000 per uh, heart failure hospitalization, about four out of 10 patients being readmitted within 90 days. So the priority of this outcome as a standalone outcome is actually rising rapidly. And so one of the uh, efforts that has been um, uh, mounted is how can we do patient specific predictions of who's going to get hospitalized for heart failure. Most of this work to date has been done actually with uh, electronic health information alone, uh, usually for the prediction of readmission. Um, so not um, at first admission, but readmission within 90 days. Uh, what we believed was that uh, cardiac MRI offers a unique opportunity to gain significant phenotypic information that could be combined with electronic health information and patient reported health um, to drive a machine learning based model uh, for prediction of heart failure hospitalization. So this was based um, on the Cardiovascular Imaging Registry of Calgary data set, which is an available data set for anybody that wants to uh, look at um, uh, prediction modeling. So I encourage anybody to reach out to us. We're very happy to share our data. Um, and at this time, uh, it was only using the first four years of data collection. We've now doubled the now amount of patients in this registry. Uh, so I think it was around almost 9,000 patients at the time. We're now over 15,000 patients. And what's unique about this data set is that it's highly standardized. And so every patient uh, gives us a patient reported health questionnaire at time of cardiac MRI that's digitally collected. And then we uh, standardize all of the coding of CMR features and collect all of the quantitative data. Um, and then we also collect all the electronic health information from across the province of Alberta. And it's all consolidated and curated by a team of students. And so uh, this study was focused on patients with systolic heart failure in the registry that had a minimum of one year follow-up and involved both chronic uh, ischemic and non-ischemic idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. We were quite um, careful to exclude patients with cardiac amyloid, sarcoid, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and also acute cardiomyopathy states, which was defined as infarct or inflammatory cardiomyopathy within 90 days and patients were required to have an EF under 50%. Um, the the uh, eligibility criteria was satisfied in 1,775 patients and formed the, uh, the modeling cohort. So three types of data were entered into the model. Um, the patient reported health data is listed here. Uh, it's a comprehensive questionnaire that's delivered uh, immediately before CMR. It does include standard comorbidities, uh, risk factors, uh, patient reported shortness of breath, and a health-related quality of life uh, tool, which is the EQ5D. Um, the CMR data, um, we collect all the data uh, from uh, quantitative analysis, which was done with CBI42. Um, and it's transferred into the cardio DI system, COHESIC, which uh, I have to acknowledge, I'm chief medical officer, so conflict of interest there. Um, and this allows for standardized scoring of all of the chamber phenotypes, as well as uh, late gadolinium enhancement patterns, edema, et cetera, valvular pathology, 
Um, everything's coded in, in a standardized way and the data made available. And then the EHR data is abstracted and we've got a standardized data model that uh, captures both ICD-10 coded data, curates them into standardized definitions, um, as well as all laboratory data, ECG data, uh, and pharmacy data. And so quite a rich set of data to start with. And the, as far as um, variable selection, we'll talk about that in just a second. The st statistical analysis, uh, standard things for the um, continuous and, and categorical variables. Um, I'm told that I won't go too much into uh, the technical aspects. So I'm just gonna say that we were aiming to compare a machine learning based model to a uh, more conventional statistical model, a multivariable um, uh, statistical model, uh, which was the fine gray model. Why fine gray? This is just uh, uh, for people uh, with interest. It's a proportional hazards based model that allows us to consider the competing risk of death because we're only looking at heart failure hospitalization. Um, uh, the random survival forest, we chose that. We did look at other models, but we chose random survival forest uh, just because it's an excellent tool for right sensor data, uh, for high dimensional uh, data that allows us to look at nonlinear relationships between variables and uh, objectively train um, a consensus opinion based on many uh, survival trees uh, as to what the relationship is between those variables for the prediction of an outcome. Happy to come back to uh, that model and what it, uh, what it entails in a little while. So overall, uh, one of the first things was to go from what was literally hundreds over you know, 450 variables that we have routinely available to us down to what we considered a, um, a reasonable uh, parsimonious collection of variables to actually present. And we ended up with 63. And uh, I can answer questions later as to why we chose those 63. Um, but you can imagine that we've got variables such as, you know, prolapse of the anterior leaflet. This is not a, a, a very valuable variable to present into a machine learning model if it's only rarely reported. And so what we wanted to make sure of is that we used variables that were consistently collected, consistently reported, but also made sense for this particular outcome. And so um, as far as the uh, different models, um, I'm not gonna go into how we trained them, um, but I'm happy to answer those questions as is Stephen, who's online. Um, we wanna go into uh, how did they perform? Um, before I do that, we did actually want to compare to some standard within the literature that had been used for prediction of heart failure events. The MAGIC score is the most widely published. Um, it was not trained for the prediction of heart failure admission. It was trained for mortality. Um, but we felt that given its widespread use, it was the most appropriate comparator. So as far as the machine learning based model, it selected 15 predictive variables, nine of which were from the CMR phenotype. Um, and uh, I'll list them for you in just a second. Um, but importantly, a lot of these were um, volumetric markers from uh, both the left and right ventricle, in including actually the left atrium, I think got in there as well. Um, but also um, we included subendocardial and midwall striae. Um, the performance of this model, actually I'll, I'll jump down here. These are the variables that it ended up including. And what's very important to look at here is how a random survival forest model works to be able to select what the, the, the strongest relationship is. And remember, this is, doesn't have to be linear relationships, so this is nonlinear, how these each contribute to the risk. And so this is really, um, this is called a mean permutation importance rank. And you can see that the most important variable that it identified was the current use of a loop diuretic. Um, after that was left atrial indexed volume, followed by LV ejection fraction, and then you can see in front of you the different variables it selected. A couple of things to point out here is that right ventricular function was quite important, um, as was uh, patient reported quality of life uh, for both mobility issues, pain, and uh, also activity. And so these came out and beat out a lot of other things. And we're finding that consistently in other uh, machine learning based prediction models as well, that asking patients how they are feeling and how they're doing uh, is quite relevant. Um, 
when we look at all the variables that uh, were predictive, and this is now more uh, important for as we go into the fine gray model, because what we wanted to look at first uh, for selecting variables for a fine gray model is looking at the univariable significance of these uh, variables. And we used a standard uh, backward stepwise approach to be able to select variables that met criteria of a p-value less than 0.1. And what you can see is there's a lot. So in this referral population, we see a lot of features that can actually be predictive. And uh, one of the basic challenges that we have is how to pick the right ones and how many to include. We were fortunate to have 333 events out of the entire population, which allowed us to consider a, a great deal uh, number of variables. I'm um, not going to spend too much time here. I want to move on because I'm, I'm looking at the clock as I go here. Um, but I did want to show uh, the uh, performance of the fine gray model versus the, uh, the machine learning based model. And what we see here is actually looking at the ROC curves for the respective uh, models at 90 days, one year, and two years. So this is a classification based approach um, at three time points. And what we can see is that um, the fine gray and random survival forest based models performed quite comparably. And this is something that we're seeing not just in our field, but in other fields such as oncology, where if you've got high quality consistent data, sometimes a well-constructed uh, statistical model um, uh, that is based on a proportional hazard-based approach can perform quite well compared to a machine learning-based model. And we can talk about why that is. Um, but we did see that um, the at 90 days, both the fine gray and the random survival forest were quite robust in trying to predict uh, a heart failure admission, uh, whereas the magic score was a bit inferior at 0.81. And when we see it about at one year and two years, you start to, you see a similar trend. But one, one of the things that's important to consider um, is that AUC uh, may not optimally represent uh, the performance of a model if there's significant class imbalance, which in this case there certainly is. And so what you want to also incrementally look at are other markers of performance such as the uh, positive predictive value uh, or precision and recall uh, with sensitivity, um, as well as the combined uh, harmonic mean of those two things, which is the F1 score. And when we looked at that, the uh, machine learning based approach came out with an F1 score of 0.6, uh, whereas the fine gray model um, was inferior with an F1 score that I believe was 0.51, but I'm gonna have to just double check that. Um, and so what that tells us is that for positive events, being able to um, accurately predict that a positive event actually, uh, when you predict it, it's actually going to happen, which is the positive predictive value. And also to look at the recall, which is basically of the number of positive events that occurred, did we predict them? Um, that actually is represented in the F1 score. So it's 0.59. And so to have an improved F1 score is important when we uh, look at, uh, when we looked at uh, imbalanced data sets. So in conclusion, both of these models performed better than the magic score. Uh, there was superior uh, performance for the, uh, the, the machine learning based model with respect to F1 score, um, but both were quite robust. And you can see represented by Kaplan-Meier survival curves here based on a standard threshold technique that we applied to both to be able to identify high versus low risk that you had about a 32 fold increased risk of heart failure admission at 90 days that continued to separate over time. So I believe that I'm at 10 minutes here. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop there and encourage discussion on this paper and happy to answer any questions. Fantastic, James, a uh, wonderful job to basically giving uh, a sufficiently deep view into that topic in such a short period of time. Very clear as usual uh, from you. So, <clears throat> um, I uh, so just for everybody, if you have questions, you can either unmute yourself and speak, or you post them in the chat, and, and I'll ask them. So, <clears throat> first of all, I there are two two points I, I wanted to to ask. So, um, to me, one potential advantage of the machine learning based uh, 
algorithms to, for risk prediction is that probably a lot of that can be automated instead of having someone uh, or because sometimes you say for the magic score, for example, diabetes, yes, no. What does that mean? Is is someone with, with a, a, a hemoglobin A1C of 6.3? There's there's some subjective judgment if you have if you just use quantifiable data and put them in. So um, do you see that as well, or do you, do you see this just incremental? Yeah, I mean, I, I I look at this from the perspective of uh, ultimate clinical value, right? And when I see yes, uh, complex risk scores that require people to manually interact with them and try to make judgments at the time, um, are challenging and hard to implement. When you've got variables that are largely based on continuous data that can be abstracted directly from cardiac MRI, for example, um, or laboratory markers, um, this allows for the opportunity for automation to be provided. And quite honestly, I think for adoption, that's critical. And so one of the things that um, certainly the, the random survival forest has some advantages on is that it does tend to prefer continuous data, it's what it likes to split off. And so you do tend to see variables that are in that model that tend to be more towards the continuous variable data sets. And those are the ones that are readily available um, from automation. And so, you know, that's really the philosophy that we've taken is to try to encourage the use of variables that are routinely available, provide continuity um, uh, rather than judgment, um, that they're uh, able to be fed into a machine learning model without user interaction and be able to provide that at time of reporting. Yeah. So I, I agree with you, uh, Matthias. Yeah. Yeah. So question from Solen, um, were the selected variables of the two models very different? Yeah, so uh, they were. Um, so again, this is the one that was from uh, the random survival forest where you see uh, quite a number of uh, MRI based variables um, plus uh, a couple of medications and then um, the uh, quality of life indicators. Um, the, I think it might be in supplement, um, the, the variables that were selected by the fine gray model um, I'm going to have to uh, come back to you because I hope I've got it. Um, they actually included uh, more of the baseline risk factors. So diabetes, hypertension, uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, these were tended to be more selected. And I think that that is representative of the way that these models like to choose variables. Again, um, for random survival force, they will tend to like to split off continuous data rather than categorical. Um, but we did see a significant difference. And what's imp very interesting about that is that the performance of each model was very similar, despite using very different variables. And, and I think that that's, um, that's very interesting um, because it means that you can, uh, I forgive the, uh, the description, but skin a cat in different ways, but still get to the same endpoint, right? Okay, thank you. I, before we move on to Theo, and maybe um, James, you want to unshare your screen so that um, that Theo can uh, share his. Just a quick one. We did a, a kind of a, a preliminary analysis, also using a machine learning algorithm to predict heart failure. And uh, in in our data set, cardiac output or cardiac index played a big role. Now mm -hmm. I didn't see that in in your uh, paper. Was it that it was not very, a very strong contributor, or was it right. was it we, not part of the modeling? No, it it actually is a strong contributor. Um, we actually made some uh, in our variable selection. Uh, we made some judgment calls uh, because we uh, allowed end systolic volume and diastolic volume and heart rate to enter the model, and so we made a judgment call um, to not include cardiac index. Um, if we had included cardiac index, it probably would have emerged. But that probably is more from a, um, a, a, an engineering standpoint of how we engineered the data set yeah. rather than an objective, um, a, you know, kicking out of that variable. Yeah. 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 But okay. you're absolutely right. That is predictive. But, uh, but, but, but again, just to, to briefly summarize, and, and, uh, and of course, it would be great if we had more time to also talk about more detail. I think this is, uh, this is uh, fantastic because at some point, people can, you, we, as, as humans can get our head around only so many variables at the same time. Machine learning, uh, while in other sense is pretty dumb, but it's very, very good at collecting a lot of information and in integrating that into a model. So 
this is very important work and uh, and uh, congratulations for that and also all the best wishes for continuing with that now let's move on from heart failure to coronary artery disease and uh, Theo Pesa uh, uh, with it in, in team with Jérôme Garot now in Paris uh, they have done some fantastic work for for CMR and uh, just uh, a recent one of the the amazing papers that they published uh, was uh, published in in Jack Imaging um, and it's called Machine Learning Score Using Stress CMR for Death Prediction in Patients with Suspected or Known Coronary Artery Disease. So Theo, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Matthias, for this introduction and for this invitation. This is a, a huge honor always for us to, to discuss our, our work la, like that with, with everyone. Um, so indeed, this is uh, directly connected with the, the, the prior discussion about machine learning. This is supervised machine learning. Um, but um, this time using stress CMR, stress cardiovascular magnetic resonance to predict the risk of, of death. The rationale of that is pretty simple. We know that some stress CMR findings the presence of ischemia, the presence and the extent of late gadolinium enhancement, LV volume, LV ejection fraction, are strongly associated with the risk of death, of cardiovascular death, of non-fatal MI. Okay, but we know that beyond the traditional statistical methods, machine learning could be more important to help us in clinical routine to stratify the risk of cardiovascular events or death in this case for our patients. Regarding the basic methods, we work using two different centers. The first one, Institut Cardiovasculaire Paris Sud with Jérôme Garraud was the index cohort to create the score. And after that, we validate the score using an external validation cohort in La Riboisière Hospital at Paris. So two different uh, centers, and I think it's really important. The aim of our study was to assess the prognostic impact of a machine learning score using not just stress CMR findings, but also traditional clinical findings like, like age, gender, etc., to predict the risk of death. And of course, we want to compare this prognostic value to traditional risk score. So we work during 10 years. This is a retrospective study with all consecutive patients referred for stress CMR in our center. So a pretty um, classical population referred for suspicion or known CAD. Uh, the median follow-up was six years. As you can see, there is a huge sample size, and this is really nice. And again, this is the work of Jérôme Garros since for 10 years now with more than 30,000 consecutive patients. Very important when you perform machine learning score, it's to assess the rates of events. In this case, 8.4% of died in this cohort. After 10 years, this is pretty logical. So as I mentioned, we work only for the primary outcome using death and we I have two types of results using the index cohort and after the external validation cohort. Before to go to the main results of the study, it's so important to remind the principle of machine learning. There are two different steps very important. The first one is the future selection. The second one, the model building. And these two steps are so important to have at the end the best performance in terms of prediction of death. In our case, we used exactly as my prior, my prior speaker, a random survival forest. You know, this is a classic one in machine learning. Also could be very interesting, but with this um, algorithm, I think we know what we did. Using this random survival forest, we can check exactly, you know, it's, it's pretty nice, I think, to discuss these two machine learning papers, but because we can see that there is a pretty similar method too. This is here exactly uh, as uh, mentioned before, the log wrong based to assess the importance of each variables using the random survival forests. And we use this threshold of one to uh, say that these variables are important. Very important. 
to see that the three main variables assessed by this random survival forest to predict the risk of death is the first one, the number of the segment of ischemia, number of segment of late GAD, and LV ejection function. OK, this is a traditional message, but so interesting to see that a machine learning showed that again, this importance of this variable. Therefore, we have at the end one, two, three, four, five, six clinical variables, age, male, BMI, diabetes, history of peripheral artery disease, history of renal failure, and one, two, three, four, very traditional stress CMR findings, the extent of ischemia, the extent of late GAD, LVF, and LV, um, uh, and diastolic volume. After this first selection variable, we can assess different sorts of um, algorithm. Random forest again, lasso, XG boost, neural network, there is a lot of um, uh, algorithm. And when we work like that, it's important to assess the best one. In our cases, we showed that in the supplementary material, the best one was this one, pretty new, a multiple fractional polynomial. This is a good algorithm when you work with um, continuous variable because we can assess um, different combination of this continuous variable. At the end, we performed a tenfold cross validation five times to have a very strong machine learning. Using this variable, we can see immediately it's important to, to go to, to straight to the aim um, um, to see the uh, global performance to predict death. We can see in blue the better area under the curve for our machine learning score. Okay, better than what? Better than a Cox model score in the same database. This first result is very important to emphasize the fact that a machine learning score using a machine learning method is better, is more optimized than a traditional method using Cox in this case, because it's a time event analysis or a regression um, uh, uh, model for a, a non-time event analysis, for example. So important. But it's not enough. We want to know if this stress CMR score with machine learning is better than the traditional score recommended by our guidelines. ESC score is recommended by the ESC. Curie's tree score is recommended by the Canadian uh, guidelines. Frank Mingram Rick score was recommended by AHI ACC, so American guidelines. And we can see that our machine learning score is higher. Of course, ESC score, Curie's tree score, and Frank Mingram Rick score don't use any CMR findings. But it's so interesting here to emphasize the fact that stress CMR finding is very powerful to stratify the risk of death in our patients. When you perform machine learning about more thousand patients, this is so interesting to assess subgroup analysis to see if it's not due to only a part of the cake. And we can see here with this forest plot that in any subgroups of patients regarding age, sex, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, smoking status, non-CAD, different value of LVF. Systematically, this machine learning score keep a good prognostic value to predict death with a very uh, a low um, interaction. This figure is, I think, very important to show that more the risk is high. In our case, the score was working to zero to 10, and more the risk of death is important using here these kaplan meyer curves or a traditional box plot. Just before to conclude, my colleague insists before, and I think it's so important about calibration. Indeed, we have to know if this prognostic value of our machine learning score is good for all deciles of risk of patients, and not just for patients with a very high risk or a very low risk. You can see here in red, observed death, in green, expected death, and the calibration was really good after 10 years of follow-up. So it means that it works for patients with a low risk of death or with a very high risk of death. And this is pretty consistent with some uh, literature about stress CMR. To conclude, 
this is systematically important. And the reviewers of Jack Imagine, after the, the five rounds of, of, of reviews, ask us to propose an external crowd validation. This is absolutely mandatory to show that it's interesting for, for clinical routine. So we use La Riboisière Hospital in Paris in different centers. And we can see regarding area under the curve. And if we check FN score, precision, recall, and all other findings like that, it's pretty similar. This is pretty similar, 0 0.75 in the external cohort versus 0 0.76 in the um, uh, index cohort. So this machine learning score, some um, uh, strong to be applied to uh, other uh, cohorts. In conclusion, I think this score, it's not an amazing thing, absolutely not. It's just a little signal to say, guys, we need to introduce more machine learning score in our clinical routine. And we are cardiovascular imaging guys. Okay, it's great. We use intelligence, artificial, artificial intelligence for our images. But when we have the interpretation of the images, come on, we have to use machine learning to improve, to optimize our decision making regarding our patients. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, outstanding, great, uh, and so well presented to you. Thank you so much. Uh, you. Also congratulations for this amazing work. Uh, this is re really very hard data. So before I ask my question, we don't have a lot of time. There's one from uh, Amin. Uh, if feature selection was applied after splitting the data, did you find different features for each fold? How did you choose the best features? It's a, it's a very good question. Um, reviewer of Jack Imaging has ask us them, and we 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 had that in the supplementary analysis, and this is pretty the same. Uh, and I think it's important to to check that in each sample we we can have the, the same feature selection, and this is uh, very close. I think it's important about the robustness of your uh, feature selection. Absolutely, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, and uh, then uh, before we uh, close, I wanted to just ask one question to you. Um, so, of course, the quality of each of these models, to some extent, of course, depends on the quality of the source data. Yes. Now, when we talk about perfusion, there is still you still have experts sitting in front of the images and saying yay or nay for each segment. How critical do you think it is? And, and uh, do you think it's something we have to be worried about when we talk about um, uh, machine learning? Or uh, what are your thoughts about automating some of that? You know, that, 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 we, um, that we say, okay, we, we need to have more objective, like quantitative perfusion with automatic evaluation and such. But we're not there yet quite with some of these methods. So what are your thoughts on that? I think, our work is from clinical routine and not from innovative pr proposal. Um, so I fully agree with your suggestion, Matthias, that it's good, but it's not perfect. And definitely we can improve that. And of course, there is a form of subjectivity between three or four segments, definitely. But I think two segments is really different to six or seven segments. However, I definitely agree with you that if we can use quantitative perfusion uh, and with a myocardial blood flow as a continuous variable, and maybe regarding the segmentation, oh my gosh, it could be just amazing regarding the statistical power of that yeah. machine learning. This is the future, fully agree. This is, I present the, the, present, the, the presence and you mentioned the future, Matthias, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, fantastic. Um, so James and Theo, this was maybe one of the best uh, journal clubs uh, we had uh, in recent times. So interesting topics, so well presented and such a beautiful discussion. So congratulations to both of you for this uh, for this fantastic work and uh, just keep up and certainly we will see you again here. <laughs> so before we before we close, I wanted to just uh, briefly point to the next CMR Journal Club on September 7. Uh, and at that time, we'll talk about the other topic that is quite frequently discussed recently. We need to get better at LV functional analysis. The ejection fraction has its limitations. We all know that. 
and uh, strain is definitely a powerful tool however strain is not yet as standardized and as good as some people think so i think it's important to discuss some new data on that on the clinical application of strain imaging and how it actually performs and we chose two papers one published in radiology cardio cardiothoracic imaging on layer specific strain analysis in, in acute mi and that for, that's from julian lutkens group in bonn in germany and another one from Christoph Greni at the, the Industrial Spital in Bern at, on the diagnostic performance of segmental myocardial strain as uh, assessed by CMR to detect microvascular obstruction and late enhancement after um, a STEMI. So very interesting. Hope to see you there. Otherwise, I uh, wish you a wonderful uh, summer and stay safe. And uh, thanks again for the presentation and the discussion and be well until soon. Thank you, Matthias. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.